Thank you very much indeed, Ian, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I thought I might just start by sort of setting out what the job of the Government Chief Scientific Advisor is and framing it in the difference between uh, the role of an advisor and the role of policymakers. Um, and I'll give you a specific example of how it's quite difficult being a policymaker in a moment. Um, the job description is actually a rather simple one. It's to advise the government on all aspects of science, engineering, technology, um, and social science for all of government policy. So it's sort of narrowly, uh, descri narrowly prescribed job. Um, and of course, that forces you to think quite carefully about what it is uh, the advice that you should provide. And of course, the advice you should provide should be on the topics the government cares about. Um, and broadly speaking, government, and it doesn't matter whether it's the UK government or any other government, should care about us, its citizens, and it should care about our health, well-being, uh, resilience, and security. Um, and it has to care about the economy, because if you don't have a decent economy, then health, well-being, resilience, and security are much harder to have. Um, and what is it that um, our health, well-being, security and resilience depends upon? It's the thing that we take for granted until it goes wrong. Um, and that is our infrastructure. And you can divide our infrastructure into three broad categories. There's our human-built, engineered, increasingly technological infrastructure. Um, so power is obviously an absolutely critical one. Uh, cities, communities stop working if the power supply fails. Um, and so energy is very important. But of course, increasingly, we've become dependent on the world of cyber as well, because um, the world is increasingly connected up by um, the internet. And cyber it, it basically is uh, the cyber world is, is also become critical for resilience. So that's our human-built, engineered, technological infrastructure. Our second infrastructure is our natural infrastructure. And by that, I mean uh, human and animal health, um, and plant health as well. Um, so the, our health and the health of the species with which we share the planet. Um, and then it's the geophysical environment, so weather, climate, um, the seas, the oceans, waves, tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanoes. Um, and again, we rather take our natural environment uh, infrastructure for granted until there is a pandemic of infection or, for example, the severe flooding that affected uh, the southwest um, relatively recently. Um, and then the third infrastructure, which again, we don't really think about as an infrastructure, but is one nevertheless, is our human social infrastructure. And of course, what's changed with our social infrastructure is with the advent of uh, the internet, the World Wide Web, there is a connectivity between each of us, uh, not only within our peer groups, our social groups, but around the world. And so citizens have voices in ways that they never did before. Uh, they can self-organize in ways they never did before. And that's having interesting um, and as yet not fully understood uh, social impacts as well. So a lot of my work is focused around um, the science, and I'm using science in the sort of Wissenschaft sense, the German sense, now all of knowledge really, as it applies to um, infrastructure. On the economy, well, you know, everyone talks about knowledge-based economies and ignorance-based economies aren't a nice alternative. Um, and that's about bringing together um, the strengths in academia with the strengths in industry, so that government can make the policies that will enable that knowledge-based economy to thrive. Um, and I don't think it's difficult to see that the, the world that we live in is shaped by uh, technology and science, uh, that the new businesses that are emerging are built around particularly technology, but also engineering. And in fact, if you look to the future, what we're seeing at the moment is a convergence of different technologies. So uh, we have the Internet of Things, we have manufactured objects that now have incorporated uh, chips that communicate wirelessly with each other with the Internet. Uh, you've got biology meets engineering meets information technology. So increasingly we live in a world where there's a convergence of technology. 
Um, and I would say that I think it's extremely important that when we think about our science, we think about how it might be applied. And that's not to say that fundamental curiosity about our planet is not important, but it's also important to think how we can use that knowledge for the well-being of ourselves, of other species, and also uh, for the welfare of the economy, because that does actually matter. Um, so that's sort of uh, a lot of the job. Uh, science in emergencies is an important topic, and so uh, through a committee called SAGE, it's a nice acronym, it stands for Scientific Advice Group in Emergencies, um, I advise on things like uh, Zika. Um, and it's important to understand that um, it's not that the government chief scientific advisor can know about all this stuff. Um, uh, I trained as a medic, a medical scientist, but of course a scientific training in and of itself um, is very important. Um, and my job really is to act as a transmission mechanism between the outside world of science and the inside world of government, be that world in academia, in industry, or there are many government scientists as well. Um, as far as possible, the job is to underpin policy with evidence. But there is something that it's crucial to understand, which is that I was sort of slightly, it was not really a joke, it's a serious point, that the job of a science advisor is much easier than the job of a policymaker. Because if you're a policymaker, and policymakers are the people that we elect as our politicians, they look at any issue through three lenses. They look at the lens of what do I know about X or Y? Uh, they look through the lens of if I make a policy, and people are always coming up with bright ideas for policies, can it be delivered? because a policy which sounds good on paper or in a speech that cannot be delivered is no good as a policy at all. And thirdly, they look through the lens of their values. And that's their political values, their social values, their personal values, their religious values. We all have values. Values are extremely important. There are values associated with being a scientist of skepticism, of curiosity, of rigor, of you know, of, of trying, of recognizing that one can reproduce things. That, so there are all the values of science, and there are values that policymakers have as well. And so policies come out of the mixing of those three lenses of what do I know, can a policy be made and delivered, and what are my political and other values. And of course, what do the values of the electorate, what do the people that elect me think? So, and then just to make it really a point, as it were, and then I'll get on to waste. Um, if you take an issue like climate change, then of course the policy area around that is energy policy because we need to reduce uh, carbon emissions. And there are three lenses for anyone who looks at energy policy, which is the well-known trilemma. Um, and the threefold challenge is we need security of supply. And that does trump most things because society doesn't work if we don't have um, energy. Um, we need sustainability, so we need to reduce carbon emissions. And affordability is an issue as well. And so any policy that looks through one of those lenses, or policymaker that looks through one of those lenses alone, is unlikely to come up with policies that can be practically delivered. And so you start seeing how complicated and difficult it is to be a policymaker. And if you like, the science is, I was going to say it's the easy bit. It's not that the science is easy. The science is fairly clear now, but the policy decisions are not so easy. So let me now move on to um, waste. And I'll move there via um, my annual report. Um, and um, in 2014, um, about a year after I started, I produced the first annual report from the Government Office for Science uh, entitled Innovation, uh, Managing Risk and Not Avoiding It. And quite a lot of that report was around exploring how people think about innovation, the nature of the discussion, and the fact that all too often we talk at cross purposes. So scientists think they're talking to publics of different sorts about the science, but the, are, the arguments that are coming back aren't really about the science, they're about values. And that's, it's important to understand and to be able to frame these discussions so that you don't talk at cross purposes. Um, last year, um, we looked at uh, forensic science, which was really a report about the power of analytical science. So um, this, lab this water, which is labelled yeah, deep from volcanic hills of Montgomeryshire, still natural mineral water, at least this doesn't say it's pure, uh, but bottles of water often say they're pure. Well, what do we mean by pure 
in an era where we can measure substances in minute amounts. And that's a challenge in the world of environmental science, where increasingly our tools can measure much of the chemical universe in many of the substances we can assay. But deciding when that matters, in other words, understanding the difference between a hazard and a risk, is a really important one. Um, and so that was about forensic science, and in particular it was about the power of analytical science in a world of global supply chains to ensure the, uh, assure something as about the provenance of a product, its authenticity. When something claims to be um, a, a piece of beef from Daisy the cow raised in a wonderful organic field in wherever, is it? Um, or honey, of course, which is quite frequently um, uh, counterfeit in some way or another. Um, and this year, um, the work we're doing is from waste to resource productivity. It's about waste. Um, and I should say that we tend to pick topics that are cross-cutting. So I don't look simply with a lens into one government department. And waste, of course, relevant to this afternoon, is a very cross-cutting issue. And I'm collaborating with my close colleague, who will be known to many of you, Ian Boyd, who is the Chief Scientific Advisor at DEFRA. Um, and I should say that all of this work uh, relies on help from experts, and Judith Petz has helped us, and Ian Stewart, it's a pleasure to say thank you to Ian as well, has helped uh, the Government Office of Science on several occasions. Um, so, uh, this bit I'm going to go through reasonably quickly, because I suspect you might want to ask me some questions. Um, so, um, why waste, why now? Uh, well, the numbers are sort of slightly horrifying. Um, um, so, each of us uh, produces around three tonnes of waste each year. Um, our homes are quite potent sources of waste. Um, and about 55% overall goes to landfill at the moment. Uh, food waste, uh, 10 million tonnes, apparently enough to fill Wembley Stadium nine times, although I can't vouch for the calculation. Um, and, of course, again, plastics and the stuff that we're dumping into the seas and the oceans, where it's been predicted that by 2050, if we carry on as we are, there could be more plastic than fish in the oceans, which clearly would be a very undesirable outcome. Um, so, why should we care about waste? Well, um, I think for three reasons. I think, firstly, resources are and the environment. We shouldn't waste resources. Um, that waste of food turns into an enormous waste of uh, water um, and uh, carbon emissions. And so, it's not simply the quantity, it's all the consequences and the upstream environmental demands on producing the food. And much of this is wasted in our homes. So, you know, this is something for every one of us. And I doubt if there's anyone in here who doesn't waste a reasonable amount of food, however hard uh, we try. Um, it's an important issue for resilience uh, because it matters for the environment. And it matters actually because there are issues around growth and productivity and some opportunities there as well. Um, and so, you know, we need to think about how we move from waste to getting more from our resources. Um, and waste management should make UK businesses more productive, more competitive. And there are areas where, if we're good at this, science and innovation can drive growth. Um, on the resilience side, the prediction is that um, uh, global food, water, and energy demand are all going to go up by maybe 50% by 2050. Um, it's quite hard to look in the future, and so these numbers are speculative, but the direction of travel is a reasonably clear one. Um, and, of course, this is driven around the world by population growth, by economic growth, uh, by increased demands as nations around the world become more affluent. Um, and as people become more affluent, for example, they are more keen to eat things like meat. Um, and... Um, uh, the UK economy, um, it's interesting, as we become more efficient, to some extent, we become a bit less resilient. And so, uh, in the past, a food shop would have a warehouse behind it, essentially, because it wouldn't be stocked frequently. And now, uh, uh, food shops typically have two deliveries a day. They re rely on just-in-time supply lines. And then, of course, if anything goes wrong with the infrastructure, then the shelves empty very quickly indeed. Um, and uh, as far as we can, we need to protect the UK from commodity price volatility, although that's slightly ironic today. Um, 
Um, uh, the resources in the environment, again, it's obvious most key resources are finite. And one of the big challenges, and it's a challenge in the whole area of environmental sustainability, is that we don't price in the externalities. Um, and so, of course, if you wanted to have a universal measure that would deal with carbon emissions, then pricing in the externalities, a carbon tax globally, would be a very powerful instrument to do it. Um, but again, it's an example of a policy that sounds great in a speech, it sounds great on paper, but the question is, is it deliverable on a global basis? Um, um, and because the resource prices don't reflect the full social cost, the externalities, we tend to use them too fast. Um, and what we need to do, if we can, is to decouple economic growth from uh, environmental damage. Um, so the report um, is in still relatively early stages of gestation, but there are five emerging themes. And the first one is the need for better data. If you can't measure something, it's quite difficult to develop sensible policies as to how to deal with it. And so our, we need more data about waste. Um, and there's a fair amount out there, but there's a fair amount more that we need. Um, secondly, we think about how we can design out waste. How can one make it easier to uh, remove waste in the first place? Um, there's also a sort of theme uh, where we are moving increasingly to providing services rather than owning things. And that could be quite important in the world of waste. Uh, there is the role of new technology. And finally, of course, our behavior is very important in all of this. Um, so uh, talking, talking about each of these briefly in turn, um, we don't know enough about you know, what are the materials that travel through our economies, uh, where they come from, what's the quality. And this matters for all of us. Um, on designing out waste, um, a product's design is absolutely critical in determining how it becomes waste and indeed when it becomes waste. Um, so how you wrap something, there are all sorts of features of products that determine whether they become waste or not. Um, and of course, easy to say, we need longer lasting products that are easy to recycle. Um, but are there market incentives there to do that? Um, so how do we provide the levers? How do we incentivize business to do this? Um, in a world where markets are global, resources are cheap, and cultures are rather more throwaway than the cultures of our uh, parents and grandparents. Um, on the issue of services, not ownership, we increasingly actually buy the service rather than the product. And so Rolls-Royce, for example, sells power by the hour rather than engines. And in fact, they make money out of re-engineering their engines um, rather than selling in the first place. Um, and there are all of the new business models around the sharing economies. Um, and of course, if the business owns the good and is selling the service, then there is more incentive to use it efficiently. Um, again, what are the levers that we need to produce? Um, on the technology front, um, innovation does change what we can do. Um, there are all the questions around the bioeconomy. Uh, can we get, can we waste much less of agricultural byproducts by using them to create useful goods? Um, and an example where actually the UK is world leading um, is around a building where um, increased modeling, um, BIM, build, building information modeling, makes the whole process of putting up a new building much more efficient than it ever was before. And if you can do that, you can increase productivity and use less resource to do it. Um, and um, uh, consumer uh, behavior. Um, so a relatively small uh, price tag attached to plastic bags has resulted in a dramatic reduction in the use of plastic bags in shops. Um, but, um, there is an issue of social norms and the culture that actually if you leave food on your plate, if you throw food out from your fridge, which would have been, was a, is a rather sinful thing to do, which would have been the case in the 1940s and 1950s and maybe even the early 1960s, that culture seems long ago and our behaviours are different from those of previous generations. So, um, uh, this is the way we do the report. We sort of crowdsource the report, essentially. 
Uh, so we have a seminar, we develop a draft narrative, we invite people to um, write chapters, and uh, this is sort of roughly the structure of our report at the moment. So, you know, what is waste, uh, the point about data, um, and some of the issues around science and technology. And then we're looking at it through two different sets of lenses. And I've increasingly realized that the best way to understand the world is to try and see it through other people's eyes. Uh, it often looks quite simple through your own eyes, and then you suddenly realize, well, everyone else's eyes are seeing something different. You think you're looking at the same thing, but you aren't. Um, and so we're looking at uh, sector-based lenses through household and municipal, industrial and commercial, through the lens of agriculture, through the lens of mining and resource extraction, and through the world of construction and demolition. And then we're looking through it through the lens of us as citizens and consumers, through the lens of businesses, through the lens of people who run cities, who run local authorities at the government level, and looking at it internationally. Um, and um, uh, we will be producing something at the end of the year. And the object of the exercise is to come up with something that A, will demystify the area for policymakers. And a lot of what I do is demystify. It's take something that is complicated and translate it into language that's accessible to policymakers. The other thing that is important, and I think just worth saying before I stop, is that I think that there is much too much focus in the academic endeavor on the single original paper rather than the meta-analysis. Science actually accumulates through time. It accumulates through a collection of papers, some of which will say one thing, others will say different things, but ultimately uh, a consensus will emerge. And one of the dangers is, and I take food and cancer as an example, you can find a paper that's saying carrots will cause cancer or carrots will cure cancer for almost every food. Um, now, how can you blame policymakers if they're then confused? And I think that as scientific community, we should spend more time thinking about the meta-analysis, the evidence reviews, as well as our original research. So it's not that original research doesn't matter, but I think there is a danger of over-promoting the individual study at the expense of the evidence review, which ultimately is what the policymaker needs. It was why, for me, coming into the world of climate de novo, the IPCC was so valuable. And, of course, I come from the world of medicine, where the Cochrane reviews recognize that med medicine policy doesn't advance typically through a single paper. Occasionally it happens. Much more often it happens through the accumulation of a number of papers and then a Cochrane review, which is a very rigorous evidence review. So that's what I need. That's what policymakers need. Um, and, of course, they have to be updated as the evidence changes so people's views uh, change. Um, but at the end of the day, I think what this report will be about is firstly, of course, about the sustainable use of resources. Uh, secondly, the need to harness science and innovation. Thirdly, it has to be, at some level, about economic prosperity, and it's got to be about economic resilience. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>